So cool. <laughs> this clip always, I'm always like, oh, it's so professional. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I'd like to wish you a warm welcome at the Bali at this afternoon. Uh, my name is Sarah Sluimer. I'm a writer and a journalist. And today we are gathered here with uh, two Angelas. Uh, so I will call them with by their last name. I think that's also a little bit classy. We have Angela Maas and Angela Saini. And let me introduce them for you. Angela Saini is an English, she's sitting right over there, English science journalist for the BBC Radio. Uh, her work has appeared in several magazines uh, like Marie Claire, a New Scientist, The Economist, and she has been awarded with prizes of the Association of British Science and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Big prizes. In 2011, her uh, debut came out. It was called Geek Nation, how Indian science is taking over the world. And it has been followed by her most recent novel, uh, How Science Got Women uh, Inferior, is the title, Inferior. In Dutch, it's Ondergeschikt. Uh, how Science Got Women Wrong and the new research that's rewriting the story in 2017 and uh, the Dutch translation has just come out in March. I have it over here but my hands are full. I will show it to you later. And then we have Angela Maas and she has been working as a, a cardiologist uh, since 1988 and she is specialized in female heart complaints for uh, the past 25 years. She is a professor of cardiology for women in the Radboud UMC in Nijmegen. And she fights for gender sensitive medicine and making cardiology more women friendly. And Maas is active in, among other things, uh, the National Network of Female Professors, the National Gender and Health Alliance, and the board of Opsai, the Dutch magazine for feministic, fe feminist magazine. Okay. So, thank you very much. <laughs> I will put this down. Yeah. So uh, first, let me ask you a few questions on um, uh, when and how did you start writing this book? What happened? Well, um, so like I said, I have an engineering degree. So for most of my career, I have looked at engineering and physical sciences stories. Then after I had my son, I think editors start looking at you slightly differently once you become a mother and you're suddenly not as available anymore. So not long after I went back to work, after I had my son, um, an editor at The Observer called me and said, um, and he said, would you do a story on the menopause? Um, so I'm sure he went through his list of female science journalists and <laughs> picked me out from there. But anyway. But he picked you out because you were a mother or just because? I think he, he wouldn't have asked a man to do that story, but that's okay. beside the point. It doesn't yeah. matter. So, um, I, it was a coincidence that at that same time, a paper was published in Canada by a trio of male um, biologists looking at the evolutionary reasons behind the menopause. And they came up with this theory that the reason women experience the menopause is because throughout history, men have, older men have generally not found older women attractive. Yeah. They've preferred younger women. And so women have somehow become infertile because they're not having sex, essentially. Mm. <laughs> um, and this was interesting, but what I found really fascinating was that, you know, here are three men with this one theory. There was another theory for explaining the menopause called the grandmother hypothesis, yeah. which had loads of work behind it. it was, it's kind of the prevailing theory, hypothesis in this field. And this says something completely opposite. It says that women experience the menopause um, or women live so long into their infertile years because grandmothers are so vital to the survival of their grandchildren. Yeah. And we have a really good mechanism for this because actually studies have been done looking at um, childhood survival rates when there is grandmother present and they really do. They, you know, they're more likely to survive and be healthy if a grandmother is present. So that's a good scientific mechanism, biological mechanism yeah. for how it could have happened. And there's loads of research here. And the women who have mainly, uh, the people who have mainly worked on the grandmother hypothesis tend to be women. Yeah. And I just thought, well, if science is completely objective, then why are the men saying this and the women <laughs> saying this? There must be something going on here. And um, it just intrigued me. As a woman, I wanted to know the facts for myself. What actually does science say about me? All these kind of conflicting ideas that we get in the press, in the newspapers, in the, in the journals all the time. What Was that the, the first truth? time you thought about yourself as a woman in science? Because maybe when you start up, yeah. when you're like 20 years old, you're like, okay, I don't want to talk about my gender <laughs> because I want to be just a scientist. 
Um, well, because I studied engineering, I was one of very few women in my university departments. I was the only girl in my classes at school because of the options that I took. So my gender was made painfully clear to me by the fact that I was in such a tiny minority at school and university. And have you asked questions about that then? You no. Know, with your friends, like, why no. am I the only one doing math right I really now? didn't. Okay. I really didn't. And I think in some ways I'd absorbed this stereotype that perhaps... I was the only one because women aren't as good at maths or as good at these subjects, unconsciously, subconsciously. It's only when writing this book that I really had those stereotypes challenged yeah. in myself. Um, and it was a real shock to me. So uh, uh, then you started writing, uh, you, you did uh, the article on the menopause. Yeah. Um, and what happened next? What, 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 were you, uh, what was your next step? Um, well, immediately I started looking at other areas of okay. research and then the book yeah. Yeah, coalesced from there. Because in the yeah. book you, you start with birth and you end at death almost. Yeah. You go through all the phases of a, of a womanhood. Yeah. yeah. And the funny thing is when you were uh, just talking, I thought, well, there's some kind of, uh, no, it's not anger, but you know, some kind of... Um, engagement in how you speak well the funny thing is when you read your book mm. you're really the scientist so you're just like well we have this and we have that <laughs> and well just make it up for yourself i think it's this but you know you're, you're way uh, uh do you know in the back of my mind while i was writing this book um it's very different from the first book i wrote the first book was reportage and i was in, i inserted myself I was there. I was there yeah. the whole time because it was my personal experience of traveling yeah. through a country and learning about it. With this, I deliberately didn't do that. And the reason for that is this is a very polarizing issue. There are There is a lot of literature on bo both sides. Yeah. You know, the, the men are from Mars, women are from Venus literature. And then on the other side, this kind of polemical, you know, science is sexist and this is a big yeah. problem literature. And I didn't want to write that kind of, either of those kind of books. No. I wanted to just get the facts out there. I had the critics in my head the whole time. I didn't just write this for women. I wrote this for those people who need their minds changed, yeah. who need to be convinced. Yeah. And frankly, polemic will not convince them. They need to be convinced on the facts. Um, so I worked super hard to make it as thorough as possible, as immaculately researched as possible. I didn't want to leave a single glimmer of doubt in anybody's mind when they were reading it, that these are the facts. Yeah. You know, I'm not here presenting this as a feminist or a woman. I'm just giving you the facts as I have learned about them as a journalist. Yeah. Um, and I, I really felt it was important to do that, to do justice to the topic, but also there's no point changing just the minds of the people who are already there. I also have to convince everybody else. And is that happening? I think it is in small ways. Um, I mean, it's changed my life. I don't think about myself differently anymore. I don't think about the women in my life differently, uh, the same anymore. Um, I hope it's making some headway. I've been pleased that even in the right-wing press, the book has had a, had a good write-up because mm. I've tried so hard to be fair. Yeah. Um, I mean, you may remember last summer, there was um, a an engineer at Google, James Damore. Yeah. So this the was Google a, notes. yeah, the yeah. Google memo. So this was a young engineer at Google who wrote a very long memo to staff saying that the reason that there aren't so many women in Silicon Valley is because they're somehow biologically not designed to be there. And um, I wrote a couple of op-eds at the time, um, refuting this and explaining why I thought he was wrong. And I got a lot of trolling on mm. Twitter by people who hadn't read the book yet. And just a couple of weeks ago, I on Twitter, because James Damore is now a darling of the alt-right. He was fired by Google, and he's now on the speaking circuit talking to people who agree with him, yeah. of whom there are many, we have to remember. And um, I wrote to James Damore the other week on Twitter and said, will you read my book, please? And he said yes. So I'm hoping he, a oh, he you, has a copy now. So I'm okay. hoping he will read it, and you maybe it will get change. the response. Yeah. You'll have to get the response. Yeah, Let's see. yeah. But uh, and after, did you did you get angry reactions after people read it? Actually, did you? Did you yeah, a lot of that? women said they were angry while they were reading it, which is what a lot of feminist literature does to you when you're reading it. It makes you realize, makes you spot the injustices. Yeah, you know, you see the world differently, slightly differently and you feel the injustice more keenly maybe than you did before. But I also hope it's empowering yeah. because when we have those facts and when we actually see the, the, I'm not going to call it the truth, 
because truth is a relative idea in science, which is we're struggling towards the truth. But when you see that maybe those stereotypes were misplaced and and the research that we have now paints a very different portrait of women, a really empowering portrait of women, then um, that is, like I said, it's empowering. It's, it's exciting, I think. And it has been for me. Yeah. yeah. Angela, uh, the other Angela. <laughs> are you, hi. <laughs> are you, are you uh, relieved to hear this story? Because you have been working in like, the scientific field for uh, yeah. a long time. Uh, is this new to you? To you or? Uh, it's, it's not new. I enjoyed reading your book, but I'm very happy that you, you are the next generation. That, again, uh, the next generation comes up with this very important issue. Because um, people tend to say, well, it will be good in the end, in a few years' time, it won't be a difference anymore. But uh, this, this topic needs to be discussed and emphasized uh, for every generation again and again. Because we have to, to change our intrinsic culture uh, in which we do our uh, scientific work. And when that doesn't change, change the subjects we, uh, we do research on, but also the opportunities for women, they remain inferior. Yeah, and, and at your workplace, just take, take just a day in the life, you know, you're, you're at work. Uh, what are the kinds of things you, you come across considering? Um, well, I, I'm a bit of a um, uh, uh, patient advocate for the female uh, cardiac patients because they are laughed at by their doctors. They're not taken seriously. They, um, they walk around for years and years with, you know, undetermined symptoms, um, you know, uh, considered to be crazy, uh, hysterical, um, like 200, 300 years ago. So, um, I, uh, being a cardiologist, I come up for my female patients to, uh, um, to understand better what the symptoms are and what we know now, what we've learned over the past 25 years, that there are so many facts uh, uh, in which cardiology is different for men and women, yeah. but also the course of life is different and things that happened in the past, they have consequences for future health. So um, by stopping seeing male patients uh, 15 years ago, I intended and still intend to, 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 uh, to, to have the care better, the cardiac care better for, for women. But are you the only one who... who I'm not the your... only one, but uh, uh, still the... the the climate uh, I'm working in, the, the cardiology community, laughs at the subject because, you know, it's a, it's a women's problem. They, some women do have problem with this issue. And most cardiologists will say, well, I don't discriminate. For me, men and women are equal. Mm. But uh, they don't want to go into the subject and to have a closer look at the reasons why. And I think Why it's, don't they want to do that? Well, what is the reason, you think? Uh, because if you choose for cardiology, you choose, you know, for a, a quite a sexy job, you uh, treat patients, we have stents, we have pacemakers, you know, you are kind of a hero. And it's not very heroic to talk with uh, women about their problems. So, you know, it, 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 it's less heroic to talk with women about their problems than with men, or? Well, and, uh, of course it's more easy to male patients. They have a shorter way of communication. Yeah. Uh, it goes faster, and uh, women have different symptoms, but they also have different underlying disease. And this is so difficult, and also hormones c come into, into the subject. And, you know, it's more easy to say, well, if you want to talk about hormones, go to the gynecologist. But we, you can't uh, cut a patient into parts, into all different specialities, because it's all integrated in the way we think, the way we behave, the way we are healthy or ill. Um, so we have to look at this subject in another way. And, and do you guys, uh, uh, first uh, let me ask you, do you, do you feel lonely in this particular area or do you find 
uh, other scientific <coughs> journalists who come to you know women men and say like okay what you wrote was very good and I, I will I will have your back or I will <laughs> stand next to you or let's yeah. change this. Well, I've had a lot of support, so I've been very lucky, and especially from young women scientists all over the world. Um, I think because of the political times that we live in, the Me Too movements yeah. and everything, there is a lot of sexism and sexual harassment in the sciences, which I'm sure you're aware, and in medicine. So they want change, and they will coalesce around anything that will give them change. And I've been you know, very fortunate that the book has become a bit of a focal point for that. Um, but I should say, I mean, for Angela and I, we are, you know, I cover medicine in my book. It may seem that when we're talking about similarities and differences, this is a complicated issue. So, for example, when Angela talks about uh, cardiological differences, that's true. What confuses us is that because there are physical differences between us, we, th we assume that the psychological differences must run as deep. Yeah. Actually, the studies show that they don't. And that is, again, for evolutionary reasons. You know, we do have different equipment. We produce the baby, so hormonally we are different. The reason we are hormonally different is because, you know, having a baby requires a very flexible immune system. It requires a complex set of processes going on inside your body, and they do have repercussions yeah. physically for the rest of your body. Um, now, there are many people who say to me, given those differences, those physical differences, then how can we think the same? How can we be the same? And that's not, that's a very, the, the idea that psychologically we may not be so different given that, or cognitively we may not be so different, it may be a difficult one to grasp. But just think about it in evolutionary terms. In our very distant past, and actually for most women alive today, the reality of life is that they work. They work mm. and they have children. You know, that's how most women live. I travel a lot for my work um, to Asia and Africa. When I'm in India, I see um, women on construction sites working alongside men, poor women, bricks on their heads, you know, stacks of bricks and a baby in a sling on their back. When I'm in uh, Kenya, I see women farmers everywhere, women security guards everywhere. This is the reality for working for women. Working mm. women are not some recent invention. We have always yeah. worked. And in our distant past, we would have all worked and had children all at the same time. That requires the ability to give birth and look after children, you know, to lactate and look after children while doing everything else makes our bodies into what they are. We are not naturally fragile. We are actually very strong yeah. um, as a sex. We have to be in order to do that. Um, and flexible, immunologically, flexible, hormonally flexible. Um, so we do have, in that sense, a different set of skills. But look at what we're doing. We're doing the same things. Mm. So in terms of, in mental terms, we'd need exactly the same equipment yep. that men do. Um, we've always done the same things. Yeah. It's just hard for people to realize yeah. that. But you were, uh, because I, I read an interview you gave and you said that uh, especially young women right now, because of the double loads everywhere, are, are more uh, uh, sensitive to cardiac arrest. They do, do get more and more uh, myocardial infarctions. Yeah. We see that uh, in the Netherlands, but also other European countries. In France, there's a very nice registry. We see it in the US. Uh, it used to be in women that uh, myocardial infarction was uh, for old women above 70. But we see it more and more at younger age. And we also see that the kind of myocardial infarctions that young women get, that there are different types of myocardial infarction. Right. Um, um, so the mechanisms behind the infarction uh, are different. It's not about uh, uh, atherosclerosis, but it's about vascular dysfunction, spasm, uh, and also uh, a sudden tear in a vascular wall leading to uh, uh, myocardial infarction. So what you see that the society, the way uh, we live, imposes new kinds of diseases. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you've talked to Londa Schiebinger in uh, your book that uh, medicine and especially cardiology is the most prominent example of how sex and gender is important uh, in this field of medicine. And I think we should use it more and profit more and learn from the differences to make it better for, for women and also for men. And how should we do that? 
Uh, I think it, it should be part of uh, uh, not a, a small uh, subgroup of cardiologists who are interested, because if you go to meetings, you will see, you know, um, uh, t t uh, well, let's say 100 women and, and three men in, in, at the lecture, but it, it has to be uh, an important issue in the whole medical field. And uh, we can learn from the differences that we have to to exchange, um, well, yeah. knowledge. And, and right now, more and more women are getting into science, so maybe won't it change like uh, in a few years that it will, no. it will happen automatically? No, it, nothing goes automatically. <laughs> so, no, no, because if, if you choose a, a very uh, macho uh, scientific field, like cardiology still is, there is a bias, a selection also of women who are a bit macho-minded. And uh, of course there are more female cardiologists interested in, in this subject. There are also many female cardiologists who are more uh, chimps than, than the guys are. Yeah. So it's not, nothing is automatically. So it has to be uh, an obliged subject in education. Um, um, so w we fight for that. But what should be a more like feminine approach of, of cardiology? What, what would that consist? Uh, well, then I think we should fire uh, a lot of uh, people. <laughs> uh, well, I, I can't even imagine you know, the, the, this is too far from my bed. Uh, but uh, if you if you have like you, you you could change everything, like you can dream. Well, I think just to to take to listen to women, that's a, a stop far. Uh, uh, but to the women patients, or maybe also to the women cardiologists. Yes, yeah, but also the women nurses and everyone. Yeah. Because in 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 male medicine society, dominated societies. Listening to women is not very popular. Yeah. Do you agree? Um, yeah. I mean, I have <laughs> Angela works in this field, so she's the expert. <laughs> but um, I mean, the direction we're moving in, when we, when a group has been traditionally excluded for a long time, including that group, suddenly um, their thoughts, their opinions, their health concerns, um, is a real challenge. And the way we do it is by creating, you know, female-only medicines you know that we focus on women because this is what we need to focus on but i think in the very long term we will get beyond even that and we'll start to look as, at people as individuals because yeah. of course not all women are the same not all men are the same we overlap in many ways as well of course so once we start to understand each individual as a product of not just their gender but also their um their experiences, their backgrounds, their history, their social level, their diet, everything that makes that unique person, then I think um, that's when, you know, medicine will be truly universal. Um, and that, I think, will take a very long time. Science hasn't got there yet. Science still thinks about people in buckets, mm. uh, whether it comes to race or gender or anything. Um, but actually, the future lies in thinking about people as individuals. I, for instance, um, may have uh, more in common in some ways with some of the men in this room, more in common with you or with some of the women in this room. And each of us are this kind of complicated mosaic of different interests yep. and traits and features, physical features. Um, even because hormonally. In your, in your book, you, you explain it like you have this cl a clock form or, you know, that if you have uh, male traits and w uh, female traits, that in some way you, some people are really close to each other, whether you're male or female, yeah. and some are more diverse. Yeah. But even can you, can what you maybe... we talk about as male and female or masculine and feminine are constructions. Yeah. They are ideas that we've come up with. For example, the very prevalent idea that pink is a woman's co girl's color and boy, blue is a boot. It used color. to be the other used way to be around. The other way yeah. around. These are quite arbitrary. Yeah. You know, or that, for instance, DIY is a masculine trait. There's no reason for that to be the case. Women are no less capable of doing doing DIY mm -hmm. than anybody else. It's just that society has divided up things that way. So we will eventually move beyond these categories, and we'll start to but understand how? people uh, by thinking about people as individuals. Okay. Yeah. 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 And the funny thing is, in that way, you don't really fit into like the new 
feminist wave right now, which is far more like, okay, man, you need to shut up now and listen to us, <laughs> and this is how we're going to do it. But it needs it. to be like that now, yeah. because we are fighting against oppression. Yeah. So when a, a group of people whose voice hasn't been heard for a long time speak for the first time, they speak as a group. Of course. Um, eventually we will get beyond groups, yeah. but we are not there now. But you're already trying that with your book, because that's yeah. what you told, that yeah. you don't want to yeah. go into this camp or the, the right wing or the left <laughs> wing or the, just to, yeah. Yeah, but I don't, I don't think it's helpful to talk outside those groups yet, because until women are treated differently as a group right now, yeah. um, you know, and this, these, there are some things that women all over the world we share in common because of our systematic oppression, yeah. because of patriarchy. So we have to talk. It's, it's, very, it's a very simplistic way of looking at difference. It's a very simplistic way of looking at the world, but it's necessary in order to achieve change right now. Yeah. We will eventually get beyond that. Yeah. But there's no point, there's no value in talking about it now until we get that change. Yeah. So I'm thinking, you know, yeah. And well if you beyond. could name a few like really, really things we could change, like on the work floor or maybe at schools or how we, how we, uh, 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 how we're, how motherhood works, all those things. Yeah. Do you have like concrete suggestions or things you think about in your own life, maybe as a mother or as a colleague or? One thing I've done. Um, I've thought about more really carefully since writing Inferior is the ways in which I perpetuate little stereotypes in my own life. Um, for instance, my son, he loves buses and cars. So in that sense, he has interest in boys toys, boys toys, but he also loves the color pink. Now for a lot of parents, this might be difficult because you might think, you know, let me steer him away from that. So he doesn't get teased in the playground, you know, so he fits in with the other kids. Um, I went to his parents' evening recently and they had lots of different hats for sale and he chose the pink hat. He really wanted the pink hat and when I went to pay for it, the lady said to him, are you sure you want the pink mm. hat? Are you sure? You know, undermined his choice, his personal choice. And it could have been, it would have been easy for me at that point to say, actually, maybe, Anirin, why don't you pick the blue one or the purple one or something else? And I didn't deliberately because I don't, I think these constraints that we have damage boys as much as they damage girls. They limit all of us. Yeah. We can think very carefully about these little things in yeah. our everyday lives and challenge them. Um, and I think that's, a, that's as good a place as any to start. Yeah. Yeah, but the funny thing is because, uh, let me, uh, yeah, I have one uh, uh, example from, from my own life. I, I have a two-year-old and he came back from daycare last week and he had nail polish on yeah. as a boy. Yeah. And, um, uh, and he was very proud of his <laughs> nail polish. <laughs> I don't know if I, if I like makeup on small children, if they're girls or boys. You know, it's still yeah. nail polish, but I thought, well, it's funny. He has nail polish yeah. on, he's happy. And then um, uh, uh, the, the nannies at the daycare, they told me, uh, yeah, it's so strange. He was the only boy who wanted the nail polish. And yeah, we gave it to him. But uh, yeah, isn't that a bit strange? And he was standing next to me and I, I saw him. Well, I was really happy, like, oh, look at your pretty nails. I saw him, he could understand them. And he was like, oh, and I saw him thinking like, mm -hmm. This is some kind of disapproval. So yeah. even though if I and you, you know, you say, okay, buy the pink head, yeah. you have this whole world outside yeah. yes. and how to change that? Yeah, well, we can start with ourselves, yeah. can't we? So the fact that you didn't disapprove of his nails is a good thing. I mean, my son also, who is he emulating? He's emulating you. He's seen you yeah. paint your nails he likes, and he wants yeah. to be like mum. That yeah. is not a bad thing. That's a wonderful thing yeah, as a I mother. It. Yeah. It's the same with my son. He sees me paint my nails. Yeah. He gets his mashed potato at dinner time and starts putting it on his nails, yeah. <laughs> and, which is so sweet because he wants to be like his mum. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, that's all, I think that's as much as we can do. We can fight the big fights as well. We can do the marches. We can challenge these little behaviors. But we have to start with ourselves. Yeah. yeah. And you have fought that fight as well. But I, 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 I read in an interview that at some point you got really tired as well, or it was like exhausting. Yeah, because you know, fighting all the time is is it, it's too exhausting. So uh, I want to have. Uh, more energy just working with people who give you energy. So that's what I do. 
Yeah. So I can't change the whole world, and I'm not going to. So so I, I pick up, you know, the nice mm -hmm. things and and the people uh, I can work with and get the energy, and we can make progress on the the subjects that we are uh, busy in my field of uh, medicine. What's the biggest achievement you've had in your in your field? Well, I think the the most biggest achievement is is the happiness of my female patients. Because that's what I, uh, that's the most important. That my female patients are happy, they feel heard, and um, that I can help them uh, with, um, with what I can do. Yeah. And for you? Um, it has, there, I've had some really lovely emails since the book came out. Um, but one of the nicest things that's happened is that, like I said, there have been this wonderful groups of women have really supported me and they have also taught me the value of female networks. I try so much harder in my life now to support the other women around me, the women in my world, to yeah. widen that network. Yeah. I, I have started networking evenings with a friend of mine because in London Because that's something women. they also tell, tell you if you're a young girl not to do. Like, no, if you want to get further in the world, don't, yeah. don't hang around with all the women, you know, but, no. yeah. which is so no, stupid. But we should be doing exactly the opposite. Yeah. We should be like the bonobos, yeah. form female yeah. networks. That's what men have done. I mean, we forget. The reason that scientific institutions are male dominated is because these ma men clubbed together and deliberately decided they wouldn't allow women in. They were looking yeah. out for each other. Yeah. We can do exactly the same. We yeah. can also look out for each other. And um, I, I try really hard to elevate the women in my life, to promote the women in my life. Um, there are so many wonderful women scientists out there. I want to showcase them. When, if you read my book, I want you to go out and read the books of the other women who are written about in, in here. Because their work deserves to be read by everybody. It deserves yeah. to be, this research deserves to be mainstream. And it's, it's a real tragedy that it's not. Um, yeah. And I think that's something we can, you know, we can do and we should do. We should organize ourselves more. Yeah, yeah. So just support each other. Yeah, yeah. do yeah. you have these kind of groups around? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm in the board of the Dutch female professors yeah. and we are a very important network. We visit every year all the, the boards of the Dutch uh, universities. We ask them nasty questions, why things mm -hmm. haven't changed. Uh, so, uh, I, I, I think it's important, uh, you know, and what Madeleine Albright uh, said, there's a special place in hell for women who don't help others. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, I wouldn't like to go to hell. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I heard that yesterday they uh, put up, uh, I, w I wanted to say hanged, uh, 12 female scientists, but it's not hanged, they're pictures. <laughs> In, in yeah. Leiden, in uh, yes. at the university. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it was about time, because yeah. uh, if you were there before, you know... Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. So I think other universities should follow. Yeah, yeah. And what do you think will, be, will happen for the next generation? Um, I hope it's better, but I do worry sometimes that we can't be complacent. Um, the clampdown on abortion rights, especially yeah. in the US. Yeah. When Mike Pence said recently, yeah. the VP um, with Trump, that abortion will be outlawed within his lifetime. That was shocking to me. Yeah. You know, that's handmade tale yeah. stuff. It's yeah. really scary. Yeah. We can't allow the rights that our mothers and our grandmothers and our great grandmothers fought so hard for to slip out of our hands because we're not yeah. watchful of what's going on. Yeah, we even have quite a backlash here with the uh, uh, Christian party right now in the government who tries to like make it, it's now, it's believe, I believe it's 23 weeks to have an abortion and they want to make it 10 weeks or something, you know, mm -hmm. they want to cut it back. So, mm -hmm. so there are like these two different forces right now mm -hmm. in the world. You have this conservative force and you yeah. also have the people who are reuniting yeah. to to yeah. make it better. Which, which is what always happens at every wave of feminism. Yeah, of course. You get this yeah. resistance. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we have to fight it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, are there uh, questions from the audience? I do think so. Maybe we can have a little light in the audience. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yes. People wake up. Okay, I will, uh, uh, I will start with you. 
but then yeah i i'm not going to let go of this microphone because then you guys will talk and talk and talk so i don't know how we can do this well can i trust you if you make it yeah okay Do you think inclusion riders are a good solution? Sorry, inclusion? Riders. Sorry, inclusion Wait, It's riders. where you insist on uh, whichever, like in a movie, for instance, that you have a diverse workforce, otherwise you won't do it. A quotum, you, you mean a quotum? A quotum? Yeah, yes. quota. So you just say, I'm only doing the work if I get 50-50 representation. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think we're still not in a position to say that, say so, but I think the initiative now that has been taken by, by the group, which was uh, reported uh, this week, Caroline Prinsen as a, as a chair, that, you know, we didn't want to have quota, but in the Netherlands, the position in science for women is still far behind other European countries. Uh, so we have to do it now with the quota. So uh, uh, I think that that's an important step forward, because otherwise it will be 2052 or somewhat uh, before we have equal positions. And we need more uh, uh, women in higher positions because we have to change the culture. Otherwise, it, it will stay too difficult for women to combine families with a uh, career. And, so we and need that. Because we all have an answer to this, but, but according to you, what is the reason that, especially in the Netherlands, we don't have like loads of female CEOs and, and we have loads of part-time working mothers? Well, we just had this discussion with um, um, the, the uh, KLM or Schiphol, yeah, I think, KLM. Uh, beca Schiphol, because yeah. they, d they, they want to have, well, they can't have three women and one man in the board. Yeah. But the opposite is normal everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But, you know, no, no. Have you heard that, be. Angela? Have yeah, the, I yeah, okay, heard about yeah. that. <laughs> you have Kaelin been here for yeah. <laughs> And, and yeah. I, I would suggest, why not make an example? But I, I've seen that some, someone uh, has been appointed now. Yeah, so it's a culture thing, according to you. It's, it's a cultural yes, but, thing. But also that, you know, that the society is afraid if wim, women would have too much power. So we have But why to. especially in the Netherlands? Because we're, we're like hanging somewhere under now a little bit above Pakistan if it comes to working women? Well, I think it's a big cultural thing in women and you see it still in the student organizations. They're in the paper every few weeks, you know, uh, uh, also in Groningen with the Vindicat uh, issue. Uh, women are called sluts and, uh, you know, they have those uh, awful things. Um, it's still very uh, rooted in the Dutch culture yeah. to talk uh, in a humiliating way about women. Okay. Is there someone? Yeah. I, I, am, I got an email of this gentleman <laughs> yesterday because he has a very specific question. Maybe you can introduce yourself. Yes, I'm uh, Tom Schulpen. Yeah, you keep it. Uh, I am a, a retired professor in pediatrics, so I'm not on the macho uh, care of uh, medical care. And I worked uh, in my life with 70% pediatricians, females. And I came to the conclusion that the reason why there are so few scientists and so, many, so few professors, female professors in the Netherlands, has nothing to do with uh, culture but it has to do with biology. And I recently published an article in Medical Hypothesis, which is called The Glass Ceiling and Biological Phenomenon. And I would like to explain very shortly why I think it is biological and not cultural. Um, it's proven in animal research that uh, when pregnancy uh, exists, the brains of the mice the, the sheep, the apes, completely change in certain parts of the brains, which is shown by uh, MRI uh, research, and that these changes are long-lasting and they are exactly in the areas which are responsible for the care of the newborn. That has also been proven in, in women last year by Hoeksema, who is a scientist in Leiden, 
She did fMRI studies on female brains after, before and after pregnancy, and she saw changes in the areas, exactly the limbic system that we call the maternal security, and that was exactly in these areas where changes were taking place. So I claim that the quotum has no use, is of no use because there is a natural uh, uh, proof that the women change uh, in after pregnancy due to hormones and that the priority is with and with children and with career. But I saw in my work that very brilliant, very motivated uh, scientists they didn't want to work 60, 80 hours a week anymore after they got a child. They said, look, we would like to work, but we don't want to work 80 hours. And as long as men have the time for 60 to 80 hours to work that much, they are much more in advance compared to the women who are, who are mother. Oh, but sorry, I read your yeah, article. Do you think it's and normal to work 70, 80 hours a week? Yeah. Do you think yes. that's normal? Yes. As a professor, I worked my whole life, but I had a wife at home. I worked my whole life 60 to 80 hours. No, but in your article, you also, uh, if I'm right, yeah. because I read it, um, you also said that if a man yeah, takes care children. of his children, no. his brain uh, yeah. system changes as well. So it's not like a female thing. No. That now I, I'm coming to the second point of my, of my hypothesis. Um, it's also proven already for decades that when a male mice took, uh, takes, you give him a, 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 a ram, you give it hormones, female hormones, the male, the male ram or, ma or mice will uh, behave uh, like motherly care for the children, for the, for the offspring. Okay, let's just stop given. here because we have other questions, but can I just say very quickly, yeah. I cover lots of research like this in my book. First of all, we are not mice. Every species is different. That's number one. Number two. Number two, when, we, when you're looking at, um, you're conflating two things. You're saying that in the brain there are changes that make a woman more caring, and that's why we have fewer female professors. Those two things are unrelated. What, what is stopping a woman from being caring and a f professor? You know, these, these two things, are, so you're saying it's because a woman is unwilling to put in the hours and a man is willing to put in all the hours because he is less caring towards his children? No. That's the implication of what you're yeah. saying. Now, number one, when you're working 70 to 80 hours a week, who is doing all the work at home for you? You tell me. Yes, exactly. That's exactly it. Your wife is doing all the work at home. That work at home needs to be done. What allows men to work 70, 80 hours a week, what has always allowed men to do that, is someone doing the work at home. You are just as capable of doing that work at home as I am. And I've seen so many dysfunctional medical specialists in my life who worked for 70, 80 hours a week. You know, it's not normal. It's abnormal. And they start to behave strange. <laughs> yeah, but keep it short. That's why I come to my second point. It's proven when you give males oxytocin, oxytocin no spray, they behave like... More motherly. And can I motherly. just make a point about this? And now you, we know that if you spend more time with a child, whatever gender you are, whoever you are, even if you're not related to that child, you will produce more oxytocin. So if a mother produces is with a child for longer at the beginning, she will have higher oxytocin levels. She will have a stronger bond with that child. But a father can do that just as well. That's why I come to the, the when you give paternal leave, it's proven by Kim this year, when yeah. you put a father, a human father, to the child one month after birth, mm. the father has the, exactly the same changes in his brain yes. as the yeah. mother. There we that go. means if you give, and that's my conclusion, yeah. give the fathers one month home leave. They okay. look after the baby. Okay. They don't want to spend 80 hours again, uh, anymore. Well done. So we're on the same page. Woo, that That's ended well. Woo. Success. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, well done. done. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, Wait, that's okay. I, 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 I think <laughs> we may be happy that your generation is out of the hospitals now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There was someone here who wanted to add a, 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 a short... Yeah, I also don't want to hog the floor or the microphone, but I think that what is really evident in this 
just discussion is that the conclusion to have mandatory paternity leave, and I mean not parental leave, but paternity leave, and that the Netherlands should get at least a European standard, if not more. Of course, of course. That's a wonderful conclusion, and I think we can all agree. Yeah, I think but that's I, great. But I don't agree well with the argumentation behind <laughs> it. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there someone else? Yeah. yeah? First of all, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm a bit confused though because the, the whole discussion goes from one level to the other yeah. and switches really quickly. So to clarify, what I find really disturbing is that on one hand you try to uh, prove that women and men are actually quite equal, but there do exist certain uh, differences that you also try to stretch that are really important to emphasize and to address. Of course. Um, and the well, thing that I miss in the discussion is actually addressing the implicit uh, gender bias and giving either the equality or the differences doesn't justify us to treat people differently. Um, uh, and that there is cultural differences even between us and the neighboring countries. Mm -hmm. Stressing mm -hmm. something similar than can we prove it by biology or not. Mm -hmm. I think it's not so interesting to address if we can prove it with biological research or not, but how we act on it yeah. and how we actually reflect on ourselves yeah, given absolutely. the opportunities seeing around us. Yeah. Well, I, I, Angela was telling me earlier that these differences, cardiological differences that we see between men and women are not just biological, they are also gender differences. So it's about how we are treated. You know, the condition of women in society will affect their hearts. Yeah. So, you know, these are gender questions as much as they are biology questions. Yeah. There has been done a very nice study. Uh, if, if, uh, if you had a, a heart attack and you're young, so below 55 years, and you compare men and women for the chance of having another heart attack in the coming years, um, female personality traits, which are often more related to anxiety, distress, are in, uh, the most important determinants. So if you have a man with that kind of female personality traits, they will also have a higher chance to have a next myocardial infarction in the coming year. And especially this kind of psychosocial factors are important in the myocardial infarctions in the younger generation. So it accounts for men and women. Yes. Yeah, I have one more question also on the medical field. Um, one thing one often hears about treating gender differently in terms of what treatment you give patients uh, is that people say that in pharmaceutical research the trials are not performed on women because it has a danger for pregnancy, etc. Yeah. I hear this argument quite often in these discussions, but I'm actually very interested in your view, Angela Maas, whether this is actually true or something to hide behind. No, it, it has been true, you know, uh, after the, the disaster of the um, uh, Talidomid uh, in the, the beginning of the 60s, the FDA has forbidden to uh, do research uh, in women who could become pregnant. So the first 50 years uh, of age, women were excluded in medical research. And this is uh, still, uh, 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 still an issue in many uh, new medications that come onto the market, because the standard patient that most trials are done is the um, uh, not so old uh, male patient of let's say 62 years, uh, because you know, the, the, the medical companies, they want to have uh, fast results. Uh, and they extrapolate the results also into the elderly generation. And we know that old people, men and women, they react very differently to uh, medication. But this also accounts for women. And uh, so, uh, and now from the ethical point, you, 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 can, you can compose uh, trials um, including women also in the fertile period of your life, but you have to, to realize uh, to do so and to take the, the proper, uh, um, uh, well, to have the proper way to, to do so. But uh, it, it, it's a field of interest, so, so the discussion is going on, certainly. Okay, next. Thank you. I'm uh, myself, I'm a professional working in the legal industry, so it's in some ways very similar, I think, to the medical industry. Um, 
I thought it was uh, it was a very good argument just made by Mr. Schulpe. Um, uh, I find it very funny that indeed that we mix sometimes the biological argumentation and the the way that we act upon it. My brother is a pediatrician and he said, well, since I'm a male, um, I don't have any trouble finding a job anywhere. I can work anywhere I want because I'm a male, so anyone will hire me. Uh, because of 70% being females and every hospital will be, you know, will be thrilled to, to hire somebody who can work full time. Um, so, yeah, when I started working myself and, and progressing through my career, I've been working for seven years now, there are so many women just leaving the legal industry and don't want to be an attorney anymore because it's not an inclusive environment. Um, and I'm wondering whether you have any tips or tricks to not only be an example for women in the industry, um, uh, but yeah, to make this more inclusive, because that is, in the end, it's that culture. is the problem that we're facing right now. Well, uh, I think what I hear from legal people is that the culture, the workforce, you know, it's, it's also abnormal uh, with the working hours uh, and, and the difficulties in, in, in getting a career into a legal office. So I think it has to change there. And I, I think uh, that also elderly uh, uh, lawyers are very important because they can look back on their career and they can impose changes to help the younger generation. So that's why I think it's important that we, as generations, we, we come together to help each other because, you know, the elderly lawyers, they, they, they have had their faults. They have lost their, their, their marriages, their children, perhaps. Uh, they have made their faults and they should uh, uh, take their lessons into their own field. So they should feel responsible for that. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think it was about two, three weeks ago that I heard on Radio 4, BBC Radio 4 that of men, about 75% think that women are inferior or not suited for certain jobs, etc. But to my amazement, apparently 80% of women think that women are inferior. Yeah. So I've always thought that education is the one number one starting point of any change. And both of you, you, Angela Saini and you, had the example of your children already getting a bias from their own teachers, mm. right? So the teachers should be educated in a way that they are much more open to having women, you know, or children, boys and girls as the same and being treated equally. Yeah, I think you're, you're right that these, we have to remember in a society in which um, these gender differences, these stereotypes are so tightly ingrained, it's not the case that men are always committing sexism against women. We have also absorbed this, you know, this, this is part of how we think about ourselves. I thought about myself in this way, you know, I really did. I thought about the other, other women in this way. And it takes such systematic challenging of every single tiny little thing you thought was true to challenge yeah. in your own head. The mental fight is the biggest one of all, the personal mental fight. And that's one that we all need to need to take on, men and women. Yeah, okay. One last question and then... Uh, yeah, but... <laughs> no. Okay, really fast, really quick. To, to change the, the uh, changing in the law, it's also in the bankers, it's the same system. I'm at the moment, I'm negotiating with ING Bank, who gives paternity leave for one month, this, from this year onwards, to do scientific research in the group of parents where the father takes one month's maternity leave compared to there where it's not happening. And we hope to change the whole atmosphere between men and women in bankers' world. Thank you. Uh, yes, last question. Um, last Monday I was at a meeting where also our Minister of Education, uh, Ms. van Engelshoven was, and there was a, a male uh, associate professor and he should stood up and he was pretty angry um, about the whole Westerdijk impulse, so the 100 extra professors in the Netherlands uh, this year, um, because he explained, well, 
I feel like I'm never going to be a professor in this soon to come years, only because I'm a man. Um, so of course, it was, yeah, the whole room was also a lot of women. So it was, there was a lot of laughter, like, well, of course, that's what we have felt for like decades <laughs> now. Um, but I, at one point, I also found, found him very brave to stood up and to express his own feeling. And I, yeah, I'm thinking about the question, but maybe just the question like, how do you view, view this in the regards to like females coming together in networks? Of course, I feel like that would help as well. But I think there's also this, yeah, there has to be this, this, how do you say this, this talk with also the men, like what does it mean that we want, we want our half, what does it mean for the men? And we have to talk about this thing that's going on there, you know, like, yeah. I think it's so admirable that you would say this. In many of the talks that I give, many of the discussions afterwards, there will always be a woman who will say something like this. You know, what about the men? I've never heard in 200 years, and I haven't yes. been there the whole 200 years, I've never heard men worry about women yes. in that way. <laughs> um, you don't want to make the same mistake, maybe. No, it's not that it's illegitimate. Yeah. It's right for you to worry. It no, does. you're right to worry. Yeah, but I agree. Yeah. We have to realize that the Westerdijk impulse uh, was um, a druppel op de gloeiende plaat. Um, we ha still have uh, in Holland fewer than 20% uh, uh, of women being a professor, which is, if you look at, at, at the European level, which is very low. So I think if he works hard, uh, 70, 80 hours a week, he may <laughs> get somewhere. <laughs> The, f the fact is that men who have been who sailed along on their mediocrity do have reason to worry that a brighter woman will come along and take their job. And in that sense, yes, men should be worried. But that doesn't mean we should be worrying about them. They should just be getting better. Then. Yeah, <laughs> because we, we also g can be worried about ourselves still. You know, we have, we have our hands full with our own uh, position, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, yeah, we we are really going to finish, you know, because now it's it's still funny and and after. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think uh, we can go to the bar maybe, and uh, Angela will be there. Maybe the two Angelas will be there, <laughs> but uh, to sign an, uh, a book, if you, um, yeah, I think you're down the hall. She will sit there, and I will. I I, I uh, thank you for being here this afternoon and. Um, I think we still have a lot to talk about and I have one suggestion because still I'm looking around and I see like I don't know five men and they all have something to say which is funny almost all of them they 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 have something to say and I think next time every woman who is here should bring a man <laughs> Yeah? Is that a good idea? Okay. Well, see you next time. Thanks for coming. Thank you.